Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Quantitative History Webinar Series. Uh, this is our fifth uh, event. So today we are really uh, very excited, very happy to have uh, my friend, uh, our Hong Kong youth friend, uh, Professor Luis Pascali, uh, who is uh, currently uh, based uh, and speaking from uh, Barcelona. I know uh, Barcelona is still under um, a more severe form of lockdown than uh, Hong Kong is. Uh, so we are very grateful for him um, uh, agreeing to speak and present uh, his paper on the origin of uh, uh, the state. Um, and of course, um, as uh, we have said in the announcement, uh, he is a professor, he is an associate professor of economics at uh, Universitat Pampier Fabra, uh, based in Barcelona, Spain. He's also affiliated with quite a few uh, institutes, uh, including the Institute of Political Economy and Governance, and the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics, and then the Center for, Com uh, the Center for Competitive Advantage in the global economy, as well as the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, he's also an associate editor uh, at the Economic Journal. I have to say, Luigi is such a rising star uh, in uh, uh, especially uh, economic history. I've enjoyed uh, reading uh, many of his papers, uh, including uh, this one uh, he's going to uh, present uh, today. So let me stop here. Oh, by the way, I'm Zhu Wu Chen, um, a professor of uh, uh, finance and economics at the University of Hong Kong. Um, okay, so let me uh, stop here and give uh, the next one hour to uh, uh, Luigi Pascali. Luigi, thank you. Uh. It's a, it's a really a great pleasure for me being here and uh, I cannot tell you how much I'm missing being there in Hong Kong in this moment, how much I would have liked to be there. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen already or probably I should start sharing it. Yeah. Um, okay. Now it's perfect. Now it's perfect, fantastic. <laughs> so this is the paper, The Origins of the State and is a joint work with uh, Jora Mascher at Ibrid University and a former colleague of mine, Omar Moav, uh, from the University of Warwick. This is gonna be a paper about cereals and civilization. And just to make it clear what kind of cereals I'm speaking about, it's not gonna be these things, it's gonna be these things. So it's gonna be wheat, barley, corn, rye, rice, oats, and millet. So following the Neolithic revolution, that is this transition of our ancestors from hunting gathering to sedentary farming, some regions of the world develop complex hierarchies, leading eventually to the city states and the great civilization of the antiquity. Now, this paper will try to address two questions. First, how did farming trigger this change? What are the mechanisms through which farming led in some regions of the world to the development of complex hierarchies? Question two, why is it that when farming arrived, some regions develop complex hierarchies while some others did not? For instance, farming arrived 9,000 years ago, almost at the same time in Egypt and in New Guinea. And in Egypt, it gave rise almost immediately to an incredible civilization made of pyramids, pharaohs, uh, big armies, complex system of taxations, New Guinea continued to be organized with tribes until the Europeans arrive um, and practically impose their, their own institutions. So what we will try to understand really here are the basis for persistent differences in things that in different literature have been called institutions, state capacity, the power of the center versus the periphery small outline of the presentation, I will try to summarize in a slide all the theories that have been uh, out there about the two questions that I raised before. 
these theories go back you know two centuries and uh, so you will i hope you will forgive me if uh, uh, i will have to condense them so we'll have to simplify things a lot then i will tell you why we think that these theories are uh, essentially wrong and then i will give you our explanation we have a theoretical model i probably will not have time to present the model maybe you will see just a quick sketch of the model uh, we will go after through the empirical evidence um, where we will run a horse race between our theory and previous theories of civilization and finally if i have time or maybe if asked during the q a uh, I will be able to provide some further supportive evidence for our theory that comes from anthropology, um, uh, political science, uh, and archaeology. Again, two main questions. Question one, how did farming lead to the adoption of, of complex hierarchies? Question two, which are the regions of the world that develop complex hierarchies, that develop the state once agriculture arrived? On question one, the usual answer is that the Neolithic Revolution led to a gigantic increase in the productivity of land. From the, first, from the same hectare of land, for the first time, you could extract 10, in some cases, 100 times more calories. This led to the, adoption, to the creation of a food surplus, that is, for the first time, workers and farmers, they were able to um, produce more than how much they need in order to survive and uh, reproduce. So once you have a food surplus, you can have an elite that does not need to produce food for his own subsistence. And from this, uh, you, you get eventually the emergence of the state. Now, I'm pulling together theories that are very different on uh, which are the regions that uh, uh, get first the Neolithic Revolution and why, and they are very different on the mechanism through which the emergence of a food surplus leads to the emergence of a state. But in all these theories, the central link between the Neolithic Revolution and the emergence of the state is the emergence of a food surplus. For instance, here on the various mechanism, I'm bundling together Ideas a la Mancur Olson, where the state is a sort of mafia. These are roving bandits that turn stationary once there is a food surplus that they can steal, together with ideas of a more benevolent state that is the result of a demand from the side of farmers that now have a food surplus that needs to be protected, and therefore they actively demand for a state, and they are willing to, uh, um, to pay for it. So this idea about the central link between the Neolithic Revolution and the emergence of the state being the emergence of a food surplus is there in practically every social science. So if we think about the very origin of, our, of economics, and if we go back to the wealth of nation, there Adam Smith would write that is the Neolithic transition, the moment at which for the first time the emergence of a food surplus make it, makes it possible to have the first division of labor. And once you have the first division of labor, you can have a class of bureaucrats, and therefore you can have complex states. Or if we go more on the uh, philosophy kind of literature, and uh, we move to the work of Marx and Engels, Engels would write that is the Neolithic transition, the moment at which humanity transition from proto-communistic egalitarian societies to societies that are based on class division, where the class division comes from the fact that now there is a food surplus which is produced by one class and is extracted by another class. And, you know, continue to cite classics uh, in social sciences. If we move to archaeology, um, the, the probably one of the greatest archaeology of time, of all times, uh, um, child, the person that coined the term Neolithic Revolution, he coined the term Neolithic Revolution to make a parallel with respect to the Industrial Revolution and again to emphasize the fact that in a very short period of time uh, we have a gigantic increase in the productivity of labor which uh, translate into food surpluses. Now I report here two summaries that come from more recent work 
for instance, if we look at the famous book of Gerard Diamond, Gun, Germs and Steel, in the introduction, he would write that, in short, plant and animal domestication meant much more food. The resulting food surpluses were a prerequisite for the development of settled, politically centralized, socially stratified, economically complex societies. So again, you see the chain of causality, Neolithic revolution, food surplus, complex hierarchies. And practically here you say the same thing, which is just told by two prominent archeologists in a book that they recently wrote about uh, the rise of the city-states in Europe. So on the first question, what are the mechanisms through which farming lead to the development of complex hierarchy? The usual answer would be, uh, is gonna be the emergence of a food surplus. On the second question that I raise, so which are gonna be the places of the world that are gonna develop complex hierarchies once agriculture arrives? Now, you understand if the theory is the one that I gave you before, well, it's very easy to predict that these are the areas that are gonna be characterized by the highest agricultural productivity. So these are the areas where once agriculture arrives, this is likely to create uh, the largest farming surplus and therefore uh, it makes it easier for an elite to survive and uh, for a state to emerge. Okay. So these theories normally would predict that the areas of the world that are going to develop complex hierarchies once farming arrived, they are going to be those characterized by uh, the, 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 the most fertile land or the highest availability of uh, uh, crops. Now, we think that these theories are wrong. And we think that these theories are wrong mainly for three reasons. Reason one, uh, we know that as a matter of fact, surplus is very unlikely to emerge following the Neolithic transition. And this is true for two reasons. First of all, today we know uh, in particular, thanks to uh, recent publication that days back, that in, you know, came out in the last five years, and the, the references are in the paper. We know that the Neolithic transition did not take decades or centuries, but it normally take, took thousands of years to be completed in, uh, um, in a certain area. And so we have an extremely slow increase in the productivity of land. Moreover, we know today that the world, probably until 1500, with some exception, but the great majority of the world respond to a Malthusian trap. So in a Malthusian world, a slow increase in the productivity of land is very unlikely to translate into the emergence of a surplus, but is much more likely to um, translate into just more people. Okay. So here, you know, I, I just reported a graph that you would see in a 101 class in economic growth of a Malthusian economy. So you have um, the number of workers or the number of people on the horizontal axis. You have the average product of labor, which is decreasing in the number of workers. The intuition being the usual that, you know, with few people, they will first occupy the most fertile land, and then as time passes, they will have to occupy land which is less and less fertile. And then you have a subsistence income, which is, of course, um, constant across all individuals. So what it will happen in this economy? Well, in the Malthusian economy, the equilibrium will be in the point at which the average product of labor meets the replacement income. And so as you can clearly see here, there is not going to be any farming surplus. And let's assume that there is some kind of technological innovation. Technological innovation here just translates into a shift outward of the average product of labor. And again, you will see that it will not create surplus, it will just create more people. Moreover, we think that surplus is not necessary for appropriation. And to make this point, let me take all of you. Uh, many of us are confined in our own houses, so I think it's very easy to dream in this moment to be somewhere else. So let me try to take all of you and bring you in a farm in Egypt 9,000 years ago. 
Um, and let's assume we are farmers in Egypt. Our main crop is barley, and barley is a cereal. And like all the other cereals, it can be stored, it's seasonal, and because it's seasonal, it has to be stored. Now, let's assume that there is absolute no surplus to start with. So we have exactly the amount of cereals that we need in order to survive and reproduce. So now let's imagine that is the end of the harvest. So we just took all our cereals from the field and put it in some storage facility. Now, at this moment, we are vulnerable. So at this moment, it's very easy for a bandit or a tax collector or a king to come and take you know, the product of our labor. And as I was telling you, there is absolutely no surplus to start with. So in a Malthusian economy, this implies that some people will die, but it doesn't matter. You know, there was absolutely no surplus to start with, but because it's possible to steal the product of labor, you can create in a Malthusian economy endogenously a farming surplus. So now suddenly there is the technology to tax. In a Malthusian economy, you will be able to impose a tax. Some people will die, or more likely, we will have a slowdown in the growth rate of the population. But you will see that a surplus will uh, raise endogenous, even if uh, you know, there, there was no innovation, uh, no technological innovation, no increase in the productivity of, of labor. We not only think that surplus is not necessary for appropriation, as a matter of fact, we think that the surplus is not sufficient for appropriation. And to make this point, now let me take all of you and let's move in a farm in Malawi today. So in Malawi today, the main crop is cassava. And cassava is a root. And like all the other roots and tubers, it's uh, not seasonal and it cannot be stored. So for instance, the cassava, once you dig it out of the ground, it practically rots after a couple of days. Now let's assume that we had a gigantic surplus. That is, we have much more cassava in our field that we need in order to uh, survive. Um, still, we cannot have appropriation. We cannot have tax collectors and kings. So the production process of the cassava works like this. Practically, you have your cassava <laughs> underground. Whenever you want to eat, you take one of these roots. You eat 99% of the root. You throw what is left in the field. And like this, you will continue to have cassava uh, throughout the year. So if someone wants to steal it from you, well, it will come. But first of all, you will have to dig it out. Second, after you dig it out, this cassava rots uh, very fast. It's very difficult to move because it's humid and it contains very little calories per kilogram. And what I'm trying to say here is that you cannot have a civilization that is based on a cassava farm. Okay, let's imagine that we were in Egypt and we want to build the pyramids and the only farming product is the cassava. That would be just impossible because you would have you know, to give food to 10,000 of people working on the pyramids, plus all the priests, plus all the pharaohs, it was just impossible to bring this food, to extract this food and bring it from the farmers to, to the elite and to the non-farmers. So after you know, spending some time to tell you why we think it's and somehow previous theories, the great majority of previous theories are uh, at odd. Um, with, uh, uh, with some facts, let me tell you which is our theory. So our theory is that the Neolithic revolution led to an increase in the appropriability of the product of labor. In some regions of the world, it made it easier to steal from workers and to tax workers. Which were these regions of the world? They were those regions of the world in which once agriculture started, farmers uh, were forced to grow cereals rather than roots and tubers. 
either because cereals were much, much more productive compared to roots and tubers, given the characteristics of the soil or uh, the uh, geographic environment, or because cereals were the only crop available. So the characteristics of cereals is that cereals can be very easily taxed and can be very easily stolen. And because they can be taxed, a state is feasible. And because they can be stolen, probably there is going to be even a demand for a state. So this would lead eventually to the emergence of an elite and the emergence of the state. So you see, on the first question, how did farming trigger the development of complex hierarchy? Our, uh, our answer is that the central link between the Neolithic Revolution and the emergence of complex hierarchies is the increase in the appropriability of the product of labor. Now let's go on to the second question. Which are the regions of the world that are going to develop complex hierarchies once agriculture arrives? Well, clearly, um, these are not going to be the most fertile region, as suggested by, uh, by previous theories. But they are going to be those regions where, again, farmers, they ended up growing cereals. Even if cereals can be taxed or stolen, but still they ended up growing cereals because, um, um, uh, because either cereals are so much productive than roots and tubers uh, that it doesn't make any sense to grow anything else or because that's the only thing that they can grow. So I would like you to understand that also in our theory, as in previous theories, there is going to be a positive correlation between uh, the emergence of the state and the emergence of a farming surplus. However, the direction of causality is going to be completely different. And this will give completely different predictions of which are the regions of the world that are going to develop complex hierarchies. So previous theories would say that it's the emergence of a farming surplus that leads to the emergence of a complex hierarchy. Our theory would tell you exactly the other way around. That is, is the emergence of a complex hierarchy in a Malthusian world that will lead you eventually to the emergence of a farming surplus. So I don't have really time to go through the model. Let me give you, you know, a very quick sketch on how the model has been built. Um, I should also say you know, that my other two uh, co-authors are a fine theorist, so this is not part of my contribution. Um, so there are two potentials organization of the world. You have anarchy and hierarchy. In anarchy, there are roving bandits that just steal from farmers. In hierarchy, there is a state that has the monopoly of violence. So there are no bandits, but on the other side, there are tax collectors that would expropriate farmers exactly as bandits would do in anarchy. Now, the state has some kind of fixed cost of organizing itself. And as I was telling you, it employs tax collectors. There are two types of agents in the model. There are farmers. What farmers do, they have a plot of land allocated to them, and they choose how much of this land to allocate to tubers and how much of this land to allocate to cereals. And in doing this, they face a trade-off. Cereals are much more productive compared to roots and tubers, but on the other side, uh, cereals can be taxed if we are in a state of hierarchy, and they can be stolen if we are in a state of anarchy. Um, second, there are non-farmers. What non-farmers do, they can decide whether to be foragers and earn, in this case, an exogenous income, or they can decide to be bandits if we are in a state of anarchy, or tax collectors if we are in a state of hierarchy. Let me tell you something about the expropriation technology. So um, under anarchy, expropriation rates are practically an increased concave function of the number of bandits. What is the idea that more bandits around there will be, 
the higher is going to be the higher is going to be uh, the expropriation rate of farmer but of course this is going to be concave in the number of bandits because you can imagine for the first bandits it's going to be very easy to steal because they would go to the weaker farmers but for the marginal bandits this is going to be more and more difficult um, and here non farmers if we are in a state of anarchy they will practically enter banditry until the exogenous revenues from foraging practically equal the exogenous revenues from banditry. What happened in hierarchy? Where in hierarchy there is a state and the state employs tax collectors. So the state decides how many tax collectors there will be around, decides what's going to be the expropriation rates. Also in this case, tax rates are going to be an increasing concave function of the number of tax collectors, exactly as in anarchy. What the state will do, it will decide the number of tax collectors in order to maximize the net tax revenues. Net tax revenues are going to be the difference between tax revenues and the collection cost, where the collection cost being um, the, 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 the wages that you would pay to um, um, to the tax collectors. Now, what is the major difference between hierarchy and anarchy? Where under hierarchy, the state can decide the tax rates, can decide the expropriation rate in a way to maximize its tax revenues. And for instance, it takes into account the fact that if it tax too much the farmers, then they will end up producing uh, a suboptimal crop, the tubers, uh, and therefore, uh, they, can, they have ways to sort of avoid expropriation. Okay? So the, 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 when decided how much tax collectors to employ, the state understand, takes into account in its maximization process that by taxing them with uh, tax rates that are too high, uh, the farmers will end up producing less. This is not the case instead in, in anarchy. Bandits do not take into account practically the externality that they produce on other bandits. The main exogenous parameter in the model is the productivity advantage of cereals over roots and tubers. Okay. So there are going to be areas of the world in which cereals are much more productive with respect to roots and tubers, areas of the world in which practically cereals are as productive as roots and tubers, and we will see how changes in this parameter are going to affect the results of the model. The equilibrium is defined by three quantities. The first quantity is the percentage of land which is allocated to cereals. And this is the result of the farmer optimization. Again, let me remind you, these farmers here, they take this decision by uh, solving a trade-off. If they uh, cultivate cereals, productivity is going to be higher. But if we are in a state of anarchy, uh, they, they, they can be expropriated. If we are in a state of hierarchy, they can be uh, taxed. The second uh, um, quantity that defines the equilibrium is the expropriation rates of cereals under anarchy. This is the result of non-farmers optimization. Again, let me remind you, here non-farmers, if we are in anarchy, they need to decide whether to enter banditry or whether to, uh, say, uh, whether to become foragers. And finally, the third quantity that defines the equilibrium is the tax rate on cereals under hierarchy. And this is the result of state optimization that try to maximize is uh, net tax revenues. There are two distortions in this model. Distortion number one is that farmers might decide to cultivate the less productive crop. And distortion number two is that non-farmers might decide to be either bandits or tax collectors, so something that is not productive, rather than foragers. Now, what are the results of this model? Um, there are two main results that we bring to the data. First of all, if the productivity advantage of cereals over roots and tubers is too low, a state cannot exist. So if cereals are as productive as roots and tubers, you know, farmers will, uh, will always switch to roots and tubers whenever there is any tax that is asked to them. And so you cannot have a state because you cannot finance a state. 
Second, if serials are productive enough, then hierarchy, the state, Pareto dominates anarchy. What is the intuition here is that when you have a state, both of the distortions that you have seen before, they are going to be reduced. The first distortion is going to be reduced because the state, when deciding how much to expropriate farmers, it takes into account the fact that if tax rates are too high, farmers will decide to cultivate the less productive crop. So the presence of a state sort of reduces this first distortion. But the presence of a state also reduces the second distortion because, as you can imagine, because the state understands that if it tax too much, uh, farmers will switch to uh, suboptimal um, product, uh, expropriation rates are going to be lower under state than under anarchy. And therefore, there will be, um, um, there will be less tax collectors under a state than how many bandits there will be under anarchy. And therefore, there will be more foragers. So we, we have a very simple prediction that comes up from this model, but I'm sure you have understood it when, uh, when I sort of gave you our big theory before. The prediction is that in places where, again, cereals are much more productive than roots and tubers, or cereals are the only choice, these are the places in which eventually a state will emerge. Okay. While previous theory would tell you that the places where a uh, state will emerge are places where you have the greatest variety of crops or where um, cereals are as productive as roots and tubers. I would like you to notice that our theory practically gives exactly opposite prediction with respect to previous theories. In fact, according to our theories, the, uh, the best areas of the world in terms of agriculture are going to be the worst places where to get a development of civilization. Why? Because in the best area, you can grow every crop. And if you can grow every crop, farmer will choose to grow a crop that cannot be taxed, roots and tubers. And therefore, you cannot have a state. So we have these two theories uh, that give very different prediction. What we will do in the empirical analysis, we will run a horse race between these two theories. So if I have time, I will show four different uh, pieces of empirical evidence that support our theory, which are based on four different data sets on hierarchy. As you will see, each piece will have sort of some pros and cons. Um, so for this reason, um, we, we are trying to use as many info, information as possible. So we will use four different uh, data sets on hierarchical complexity. The first data set is going to come from the ethnographic atlas. This is a source that has already been used several times in the field of comparative development. Uh, it's a database of almost um, 1,300 societies that are captured at before any significant industrialization, and they are normally captured before uh, the uh, European colonization. So these societies normally are captured between the 18th and the 19th century. And for them, we have data on their level of hierarchical complexity. We have data on their major crop type. Uh, we have data on whether there was a farming surplus for a subset of this society. And we have data about the burden that comes from uh, a centralized taxation. Now, this is a fantastic data set. However, it has two problems. Problem number one is that it's a cross section. So, you know, we will run here two stage least square estimate. We will run a hundred million robustness checks. But at the end, this is going to be a cross section. Uh, so um, it requires sort of an act of faith to say that there are no other omitted variables that might be driving our estimate. Second, this database refers to societies in the 18th and 19th century. And although this is very interesting because it shows somehow the persistence of our story, the great majority of our theory goes back in time <laughs> uh, much more. So we would like eventually to, to see what happened around the Neolithic transition. 
So for this reason, we move to this second database. The second database uh, is, uh, uh, was compiled by Borkan and co-authors uh, from the University of Brown. Um, what it does is, this is a panel, so it covers all the world and it covers 2,000 years, uh, the last 2,000 years of, of human history. And we will see there how we can use a natural experiment of history, the Colombian exchange, to try to isolate in a panel setting a variation in the productivity advantage of cereals over roots and tubers, what we think is fundamental for the development of complex hierarchies, and an exogenous variation in the productivity of the land, what other theories think is fundamental for the development of complex hierarchies. So what is nice here is that this is a panel data set with a, an experiment, a, a natural experiment, so somehow we will be able to control for omitted geographic characteristics. The problem is that somehow, because the, the natural experiment, uh, you know, go back to the Colombian exchange, still we are not going in time too much. For this reason, we will look at, we will use the third data set, which is a database about uh, archeological evidence. Um, so here we have the location of ancient urban settlement and archeological sites um, that are, that practically show the presence of some complex uh, hierarchy. Now, this is a fantastic database and especially this second one, to the best of my knowledge, is the first time that is used in economics. But on the other side is a cross section. So with all the problem of the cross section. So the last exercise that you will see is an archeological database, now uh, radium carbon dated. So this is a panel. And here we will be able to exploit some diff and diff uh, looking at the period before and after the Neolithic transition. Now, I've shown you what are our measure of hierarchy. Now, let me tell you what, our, what are going to be our measure of sort of land productivity, what previous theory would tell you is conducive to civilization, and productivity advantage of cereals over roots and tubers, what our theory would say is conducive to uh, civilization. Um, I can see that there are some questions in the Q&A. So, um, okay, so I, 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 I will take them, uh, I will follow the suggestion on Beth and, and take them uh, at the end of the presentation, if that's fine. So, um, we use three different data sets here. The first database is a database that was compiled by the FAO. This is a database that has already been used in comparative development. And it practically gives you the productivity of each crop in each raster point of the world um, in the 1950s in a subsistence type of agriculture, which is rain fed. So the, what is nice of this database is that we will be able to create a perfect measure of the productivity advantage of cereals over roots and tubers in practically every spot of the world. What is problematic of this database is that these are estimates on potential productivities that go back to the 1950s. Okay? So although they apply to varieties of crops that have been around in the last five centuries, you know, when we really go back in time to, um, uh, and we approach the Neolithic Revolution, then this database is, is going to become very noisy and probably uh, we would have some endogeneity problem because you understand that uh, crops are evolved endogenously based on the characteristic of the soil. So for this reason, we have compiled together with the Global Crop Diversity Trust a database on where, um, on the uh, presence of wild relatives of cereals and roots and tubers. So this tells us which were, what, which was the potential for domestication of cereals rather than roots and tubers in every raster point of the world. And again, because these are wild relatives here, we will sort of be able to go back really in time 
to the native transition. We'll have much less measurement error when we look at uh, um, uh, the, the effects on hierarchy there. And moreover, there is not going to be the problem of the endogeneity of the process of selection of uh, domesticated crops. And finally, we will use in the last part of the presentation the distance with respect to centers of independent domestication of different crops. Okay, so four empirical exercises. Let's start with the first one. The first one, let me remind you, is going to be based on the Marduk ethnographic atlas. So this is going to be a cross sectional of 1300 societies. Um, we run the following regression where we regress hierarchy on a dummy variable that identify whether the main uh, farming crop of the society was a cereal crop. Now, of course, you understand we cannot run an OLS regression. We will have all the endogeneity problem you can imagine. In fact, our theory tells us that we would have endogeneity problem. Our theory would tell us that in a state, uh, expropriation rates are lower, and therefore farmers may, adopt, may decide to adopt uh, cereals rather than roots and tubers. So we will have a first stage where we uh, try to isolate an exogenous variation in the decision to cultivate cereal by regressing this dummy on the cereal advantage over roots and tubers calculating using the FAO dataset. Again, the unit of observation here is going to be the society in the ethnographic atlas and the cereal advantage is going to be the difference between the potential yield that you can get from cereals in a subsistence agriculture, which is rain fed, uh, minus the potential yield that you can get by cultivating either roots or tubers. So how do we create our measure of productivity of the land and how do we create our measure of productivity advantage of cereals over roots and tubers? Well, what we do is, Again, I was, as I was telling you, the FAO data set tells you the potential yield of each crop in each raster point of the world. So in each raster point of the world, we first define what is the most um, potentially um, productive cereal, which is the most potentially productive uh, crop between roots and tuber, and which is the most uh, productive crop among all. For instance, this shows you the most productive crops among all today. And you can see that in Africa, the most productive crop are um, uh, maize and, uh, uh, and rice. So once we compute what is the most productive cereal and what is the most productive uh, among roots and tuber, we just take the difference in terms of potential calories. And this is the result. For instance, if you look at Africa, you will see that there is an inverted L-shaped region in which cereals are much, much more productive with respect to roots and tubers. And then there is a region here in which roots and tubers are practically as productive as cereals. So our theory would predict that in this inverted L-shaped region, um, the the main crop is going to be cereal and we will have complex state well exactly the opposite will happen in this region here now let me introduce you our societies these are the societies um, and what this map report is the main crop again let's look at africa blue is uh, are those societies that have cereal as main crop uh, red identify those societies that have either roots or tubers and yellow those societies that have tree fruits. Exactly, you know, it's not surprising that where cereals are much more productive with respect to roots and tubers, societies ended up growing cereals. While in the region in the interior of Africa here where we have seen the two have practically the same productivity, societies ended up growing either roots and tubers or tree fruits that have the exact same characteristics. So, of roots and tubers in terms of appropriability. This is just the table regression showing the first stage. After you have seen the map, you understand that you know, results are gonna be very strong. So for instance, let's focus on column two, 
here what we do is we regress a dummy that identifies those societies for which the major crop was a cereal grain on the cereal advantage and on the land productivity. And I would like you to notice that practically the only thing that matters that explain uh, what kind of crop you grow is of course the relative productivity of this crop with respect to others. So the cereal advantage is what explain whether you grow cereals. This is, uh, I'm sure, not surprising for any one of you. Now let's move to the second stage. Before moving to the second stage, let me show things on a map. Um, what this map report is the level of hierarchy for our society. Uh, this, is a, uh, this takes a numeric number that goes from one to five. Uh, one uh, identifies societies that are organized as tribes, two societies that are organized as small chiefdom, large chiefdom, small state, large state. So let's go back to Africa. Uh, let me remind you that there was an inverted L-shaped region here um, in which cereals were much more productive with respect to roots and tubers. We have seen that in this region, societies ended up growing cereals. And I would like you to notice that practically all the states in Africa are located in this region here. All the dark blue air uh, societies are located exactly in these regions as our theory predicts. Instead, if we look at the region where uh, societies tend to grow roots and tubers uh, because again of geographical characteristics uh, of the places, uh, here societies also tend to be organized as tribes. Now, I don't have time to show you the reduced form. Let me move directly to the two stage least square estimate. So let me show in column two now the two stage least square estimate. Again, what we are doing here is we are regressing hierarchy on a dummy that identify whether uh, the main crop of the society is cereal. And we instrument this uh, uh, using the potential uh, caloric advantage of cereals over root and tubers that come from uh, the geographic data of the FAO. The coefficient is positive, is statistically uh, significant, and is very large. What does it mean, the size of a coefficient of one? Well, it practically means that if a society, because of exogenous reason, is growing cereal, it ends up with a level of hierarchy by one step, uh, that is, one step higher. This is a lot. This tells you that one society switched to cereal uh, is going to move from being a tribe to be a chiefdom or from being a chiefdom to be a state. Um, now, column one and column five report here ULS estimates, column two, three, four, and column six, seven, eight uh, report the two stage least square estimates. The columns that go from one to four, they have practically uh, no continent fixed effect, while the other columns, they look at variation within continent. Okay? So, for instance, uh, let's focus here on uh, uh, column three and column seven. Here we control for land productivity. And I would like you to notice that when we control for land productivity, practically land productivity does not have any impact on the level of hierarchical complexity. I, I find it super interesting in column four and eight, we even control for the dependence of the society on agriculture. And we find that this, that it doesn't matter whether you do agriculture if you don't do agriculture with cereal for the level of hierarchical complexity of the society. So what this estimate is telling you is that there is no difference in the level of hierarchical complexity between farming societies that uh, use uh, roots and tubers and non-farming societies. So the big change in humanity, the big transition in humanity that leads to the state comes from farming cereals. Um, in this table, I look at uh, the impact of farming cereals instrumented exactly as before on the existence of a farming surplus and on the existence of a centralized tax burden. Now, I would like you to notice that, first of all, we find that growing cereals leads to a farming surplus. But second, and I find this incredibly interesting, we find that land productivity does not lead to more farming surplus. So, 
uh, what this is telling you is somehow exactly the opposite of what previous theories were finding. And is in line with our intuition that in a Malthusian world, um, it's very unlikely for land productivity to translate into farming subjects. And also, the, the same agriculture does not lead to higher level of farming subjects. We find exactly the same result for tax burden. Now, we run 100 million of robustness checks, but you know, as I was telling you, this is, after all, a cross-sectional analysis. So for as many as I add there, I will not be able to fully convince you that there are not some kind of omitted variable that is driving our estimates. So let me move to the second part of the analysis. Sorry, here I'm having, which is based on uh, panel estimates. So here what we do is, again, we use this database of hierarchy that was compiled by Borkano co-authors. This database look at the last 2000 years of human history and it divides the world into 159 regions which correspond to the modern day country and for each of these regions it tells us whether the region was organized as a tribe, as a chiefdom or as a state every 50 years in the last 2000 years. So what we do is in a parallel kind of format, we regress this measure of hierarchical complexity on the serial advantage. So the potential extra calories that you gain in this particular region if you cultivate cereals rather than roots and tubers. And we regress on land productivity. So the total amount of calories that you can get from the land. And we have, uh, uh, of course, the uh, region fixed effect and uh, um, uh, and the year fixed effect. Now, how can we generate a variation in the potential yield that you get uh, from different crops? Well, we will use for this the Colombian exchange. When the new world is discovered, you get a lot of crops that, that moves from the uh, new world to the old world and from the old world to the new world. For instance, the old world, it gets the cassava, and it gets the maize. If you think about Africa today, these are the two main crops in Africa today. So depending on the geographical characteristic, some regions uh, get a productivity boost from, the, from these new crops, and some regions they get a boost in the caloric advantage of cereals over roots and tubers from these new crops. So we will try to understand whether changes in cereal advantage have an impact on hierarchy, as our theory would predict, and whether changes in land productivity have an impact on hierarchy, as previous theories would predict. And the results are in this table here. I would just like you to notice that if we were to look separately at land productivity and at the cereal advantage, it would seem that both have some impact on the level of uh, hierarchy, although the impact on the, of land productivity is uh, not statistically significant and is somehow smaller. But the interesting point is when we use these two regressors at the same time. Let's look at column three. Again, let me remind you here, there are no controls, but there are the fixed effects. So changes in serial advantage, they translate into changes in hierarchy. On the other side, changes in land productivity do not seem to translate into any change in hierarchy. Here, the, uh, uh, this uh, coefficient is never statistically significant. And for some weird reason, it's actually negative. So this seemed to, to go against previous theories. Um, we uh, control for several things interacting with the year fixed effect. In particular, we control for all the geographical characteristics one by one that explain the different in yields across the different crops. So precipitation, temperature, elevation, ruggedness, absolute latitude. And again, results are consistent all over. Um, of course, we, we also check 
for whether there are three trends here. Um, so we, uh, uh, the most way, most flexible way to, to, to see this is regressing hierarchy on uh, the change in the serial advantage that is generated by the Colombian exchange and let this change in serial advantage have a different impact um, in the different uh, time period. And you can see here that it has an impact only after the Colombian exchange. Okay, so it seems that um, the uh, serial advantage uh, as an impact of the, uh, the change in the serial advantage due to the Colombian exchange is an impact only after the Colombian exchange. In particular, the full impact uh, happens in the 1700, which is in line with uh, um, uh, anecdotal evidence that say that practically the Colombian exchange was completed by, uh, by this century. And you can see that there are no pre trends. Now, also in this case, we run a million of robustness checks. I, I won't have time to go through them, but if you ask this during the, the Q&A, there are some very, very interesting ones. Now, what is the problem with the analysis that you have just seen? Well, we have just looked at the last five centuries of human history. Well, the last maybe 1,000 years of human history, but really we wanted to prove that our theory was related with the rise of civilization. And so in order to do this, we need to go back in time a little bit more. And this is exactly the purpose of this uh, third empirical exercise. This is a cross-sectional exercise. What we will do here, we will, we will regress uh, the presence of an ancient settlement in a raster point of the world on a dummy that identify whether the point had some wild relative of cereals, so whether there was potential domestication for cereal, a dummy that identified whether the point had um, some wild relatives of roots and tuber, and a dummy that identified whether the point had both wild relatives of cereals and wild relatives of roots and tubers. Our theory predicts that the best points of the world for the rise of a civilization are those places where wild relatives of cereals are available, but wild relatives of roots and tubers are not available. So our theory predicts here that alpha one should be the largest between these two locations. While previous theories would predict that alpha three should be the largest, the best areas of the world should be those areas where farmers can choose among all possible crops, because it's here where you can increase uh, the most the productivity of the land. Um, we also run the same regression, but now instead of looking at the presence of local wild relatives of uh, crops, we look at distance of the spot of the raster point with respect to places of independent domestication of cereals and independent uh, domestication of uh, uh, of any crop. Let me show you this result with maps because I think, you know, once you see the maps, uh, results are so striking that I don't need to show you the regression. I will show you the regression if you think this is necessary in the Q&A, but I think the maps are, are sufficient. So first of all, let me show you this map. Uh, this is a map which is purely based on biogeography. So this is the result of my collaboration with this global trust, uh, you know, I asked them to collect this data uh, on where the wild relatives of domesticated crops were. Um, and uh, this is what they sent me back. So the red areas are areas in which there were wild relatives of cereals. The more red you are, the more cereals were available. The yellow areas are the areas in which there were both cereals and roots and tubers. And uh, green areas are areas in which only roots and tubers were available. And I don't need even to show you the dependent variable. I mean, we all know very well where civilization started. The civilization started here, Fertile Crescent, look how red is this area. It started here, it started here. So uh, you see that Practically, this is a one-on-one -on -one correspondence uh, with respect to the places where civilization started. But let me be a little bit more formal, but still will map. Let me show you the places where you have the first large settlement before the classical era. So before 500 BC, this is where you have the large settlements. 
and practically you would see that there is there are no exceptions. There are two exceptions actually, one here and one here. And these are incredibly interesting exceptions, which will make our point. Uh, and I would love, you know, if you ask me about this in the Q&A, I can tell you a little bit more about this. But all the other cities, they were practically founded in red areas. So for instance, if you look at the America, they were founded here. If you look at the rest of the world, they were founded either in the Fertile Crescent or in this part of China. Uh, but that's, that's where you get, or you know, in this part of the world. So I, I think the correspondence here is just absolutely incredible, is, is a one-to-one. -one. I mean, when I've seen this map, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I was like, okay, we, we, this map just, if I would have shown this map to an archeologist and I would have said, you know, this is a map where about where civilization started rather than a map on, and then a geographical map, I think he might have believed. This is the same thing, just uh, in a regression format. I don't need to show you the result. The only thing that mattered for whether there was a settlement, either 500 BC or at the peak of the classical era, is that there were cereals available, but there were no roots and tubers available. Okay, and again, I'm speaking about wild species here. Okay, so these are uh, species that before the intervention of, of, of humans. In the paper, I show other results uh, which are very much uh, related, but instead now we're looking at the first settlements, I look at um, uh, archeological evidence of complex civilization. So things like pyramids, temples, etc. So here are the same cities that you've seen before, but now the areas that you see are areas where agriculture started independent. The blue area are areas in which agriculture started independent with cereals, and the yellow areas are areas in which agriculture started independent with roots and tubers. And again, I don't need to show you any regression here. You can see that the great, great majority of, spot, of uh, cities, they are located next to areas where agriculture started independent with, with cereals. And on this, we have only one exception. And again, if you want to ask me more about the Incas during the Q&A, I will be very happy to, to tell you about this because I think it's an incredibly fascinating uh, civilization. So these are the same results, just in a regression format. Again, I promise you, the only thing that matters is whether how close you are with respect to areas of independent or domestication of cities. Now, some of you may raise the question, which is of course very relevant, that this is a cross-sectional result. So there might be some omitted variables that maybe I'm not controlling. Of. I promise you, we run a, a lot of con, uh, robustness checks and we have millions of, uh, eventually, of uh, geographical controls, but you can still think that there might be some omitted uh, characteristics that, that, that I'm missing. So for this reason, um, we move here to a diff and diff kind of analysis. Uh, again, this fourth data set about hierarchy practically is uh, put together archaeological sites which are carbon dated. And so I will be able to know whether the site predated or post-dated the Neolithic transition. And uh, what we do here is practically we regress the, the, the settlements or the sites now, on the presence of wild relatives of cereals interacted by the post-Neolithic transition dummy, wild, presence of wild relatives of roots and tubers interacted with the post-transition dummy, and places that had both, again, interacted with the post. And because now we have a different diff, we can sort of control for geography through the uh, raster points, fix and facts. And we can run also the same thing by looking at distance with places of independent adoption of agriculture. Now, these are the results. Um, I don't have time to go through these in details. Let me look at, you know, I think I have two minutes left, so I have to wrap up. So let me look just at column one and two. What column one and two will tell you is that practically the only variable here that has a coefficient which is statistically significant is the interaction of post-Neolithic transition with respect to and uh, presence of cereals. Okay, you can see that here the coefficient is positive and statistically significant. 
Instead, places that other theories would predict should develop the most complex civilizations, so places that have practically every possible crop you can imagine, uh, they, here we do not see any impact. So once the Neolithic revolution arrived, we do not see an increase in uh, 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 archaeological sites uh, coming back from, from these spots here. Okay. And exactly the same if we look at distance with respect to places of adoption of independent adoption of cereals and distance with respect to uh, adoption of agriculture. The only thing that matters is distance with respect to adoption of cereals after the Neolithic transition. Okay. Now, uh, also here we run a lot of robustness checks. Uh, I leave there for the, the q and I think my time is, is practically over. Uh, I have some supportive evidence that sort of show how our theory can apply not only to farming societies, but actually also to hunting gathering societies. So there are some classical examples that if you are interested, um, I, I will be able to speak more about them in the Q and A about Native Americans in California. Um, um, single women in Malawi today, uh, Native Americans in the Northwestern coast, the Natufians, uh, state formation in Congo today, and then we have something about the uh, mafia in, uh, in Sicily. So let me conclude. We started with a really big question. That is, what is behind persistent differences in the level of hierarchical complexity across different regions of the world. I think that the great majority of previous theories would tell you, well, the, what, the, the difference comes from differences in agricultural productivity. Places where agriculture is more productive, they are able to produce larger farming surplus, and therefore they are able to sustain a larger elite. Our theory is completely different. Our theory is that places that um, ended up growing cereals because they are incredibly more productive with respect to other crops or because they are the only crop available. In these places, it's very easy to tax and to steal from workers. And these are the places where a state is gonna be feasible because taxation is feasible. And a state probably is gonna be demanded because uh, you can steal from workers. So why is it that New Guinea did not develop any civilization why Egypt did, even if agriculture started at the same time, 9,000 years ago. Well, previous theories would tell you because New Guinea, uh, the land was not productive. Now we know today that agriculture was actually extremely productive in New Guinea. The land was extremely productive um, and they had actually animals before anybody else. Uh, so, previous theories do not seem to work there, our theories seem to work. That is, New Guinea only had wild relatives of roots. That's why they ended up um, with an agriculture that was based on root. And that's why you could not have taxation and probably a state was not even made. Thank you very much. And my apologies for taking extra two minutes. Uh, hi. Okay. Uh, thank you, Luigi. So this is uh, a very interesting uh, paper. I know this paper uh, is already published, so probably uh, it's not published. It's oh, not, not published. yet published. I it no, no, no. It's no, it's, yeah, huh? no. This is uh, uh, no. It, it's currently under revision with JP. Oh, okay. It's not published. Okay. So there is still time to uh, to consider. I mean, after you have millions of different robustness checks, uh, you can still do more. So, yes. So you, uh, for um, one set of uh, your exercises, you use the uh, hierarchy uh, index uh, as the uh, Y variable in the analysis. I wonder, I mean, of course the hierarchy index that just measures um, uh, complexity in terms of uh, layers uh, of uh, the hierarchical structure. I wonder whether you can use um, some other social complexity uh, metrics. For example, um, 
whether the local uh, region's language has a uh, complicated uh, detailed terms for each separate type of interpersonal relation. Uh, just as an example, uh, one of my favorite examples is um, uh, in, in the English language, uh, there are only two words, uh, aunt and uncle. Uh, to describe all kinds of, uh, you know, relations from mother's side, father's side, and the in-law's side, and, and so on. Just two words, uh, aunt and uncle. But in the Chinese language, then, oh, there are many hundreds of different terms. So depending on how many degrees uh, your relation is with uh, X, Y, Z, uh, you know, where the degrees are measured in terms of uh, generational or layers of uh, biological uh, distance and, and so on. Actually, how is it in Italian? Uh, does, does the Italian language have all... It's slightly, it's slightly more complex than the English one, but I don't think it arrives to the levels of what you were describing before. But I, I think you raise a fantastic point. And, you know, frankly, I had never thought about this. And uh, I, I, I think this, uh, this is actually something that I should do immediately. Um, I, it's a great, great idea. Uh, I think that actually from the complexity of the language, you can also get something about, you know, how many terms you have to describe bureaucracy. You know, yeah. Whether you have two terms, priest uh, and chief, uh, or, uh, you know, a hundred million terms uh, that describes uh, the million of different uh, specialized bureaucrats uh, yeah. that, that you can have. Um, they, this they is an have, absolute... Yeah, they can have other dimensions of the social uh, structures, complexity, and so on. Yes, I, actually, you know, speaking about this, uh, another potential idea that, you know, I'm sort of, I've been thinking about this for a while, uh, recently, Stelius Michalopoulos and, uh, and co-authors, they came out with, uh, with a paper about folklore, uh, where they have amazing evidence about stories that were around in different societies. And uh, actually, uh, and about the themes that you would see in these stories. And uh, actually, this is a, sort of another, very much related with what you were saying, you know, look at the complexity of these stories, how they, how they, uh, and, uh, you know, how they speak about the bureaucracy, you know, do they have words like, uh, you know, kings and bureaucrats and, uh, you know, tax collectors or these things are just not there. Uh, this is a, another way to, to look at this. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is an amazing idea. Amazing, amazing idea. Let me turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Sushan Ma. Uh, Sushan, so you take okay. it from here. Yeah, I will uh, moderate the following discussions. Uh, let me first introduce our panelists, uh, the invited discussants here. The first is Professor Henry Chen uh, from Economics Department of Hong Kong University. He also works on uh, political economy and uh, also Professor Cong Liu from Jinan University and Guangzhou. Uh, he's a rising star in economic history. Uh, of course, uh, we also have Professor Ji Wu Chen. So now let's turn to the Q and A session. Uh, maybe Henry. Henry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, please. So, so I'm, I, I, I'm very glad to see this presentation. This talk is fascinating. I like it very much. As you said. Um, this is a big question. Uh, it's a fascinating yes. question and interesting. Uh, so uh, a, a few decades ago, we learned from Olson and many others that uh, how the state arises, right? There's a roaming bandits. Somehow they chose to stay, then they become the state. Then this paper actually helped us to understand better why they actually chose to stay. Uh, so th this, so, so, you know, that's make the, uh, the understanding of the emergent of state uh, more complete. So I like this aspect a lot. And I'm working on the theory side. So I, I want to ask a couple of questions, clarifying questions about your theory uh, so that I can understand better. 
So first of all, um, if we follow that story I just said this crap or my understanding if, if it's correct then it could explain one layer of bureaucracy or one layer of hierarchy okay yes so suppose suppose in even even in 19th centuries uh, in Russia in China if you look at how the state and the peasants interact it's very simple I pay tax as a peasant that's it um, if I don't pay tax they send people over beating me up. That's it. They use a yeah. virus, extract a tax from me. That's the yes. end of the story. So no matter how many layers uh, beyond my village, beyond my town, I don't care. It has nothing to do with me. Right? Absolutely. So, yes. so how this uh, hierarchy and the states uh, sort of, you know, um, play a role in your model or in your theory, that's something I, I wanted to understand better. So now that and, this is a, an amazing point. Uh, shall I answer to this or like, is this next one a different question or? Uh, I have the other two questions. So if you want to Perfect. go on, then I, I will be loving to, to learn these because in, in your yeah. empirical analysis, hierarchy is a very important measure of this, right? Yes, yes. So I, I mean, your And also I have is, a follow up, like go ahead. Your, your question is absolutely, you know, fundamental one, and I'm scared, you know, my my answer probably will not be as satisfying as you expect. But uh, uh, yes, I agree that right now I am simplifying everything, you know, to to uh, you know, on one side there is anarchy, and on the other side there is a state, and you don't have, you know, nothing in bet in between. You know, we know very well the state can have completely different level of complexity with different numbers of layers. So my interpretation of these differences across complexity once you have a state, um, they have two. First of all, practically, I think there is a sort of um, correspondence of how much you can extract from farmers and how much a state can be complex. So in places in which literally farmers have only cereals available, you can extract a lot. But as soon as they start having things that cannot be taxed, uh, you know, you can extract much less because as soon as you start imposing tax rates that are high enough, they will switch to the suboptimal, um, to the suboptimal crop. So the, you know, the superficial answer would be to me, how many layers a state is gonna have, how much complexity the state is gonna have, is going to depend ultimately from how much you can extract from from uh, from the farmers, and so somehow it's going to have some kind of monotonic uh, uh, function of the potential how much a potential advantage of cereals over roots and tubers. So this is the you know the um, the superficial answer. I should also say that my co-authors, they also have a, a second paper, which is mainly a theoretical paper, which is exactly about this. That is, you know, once a state emerge, how will a state organize itself? Uh, and that's uh, in this paper, which has been published, I think, on NAS, or uh, if I'm not wrong, they relate this to the transparency of the work of labor. So practically what they say is that the, the more easy it is to observe the productivity of workers, the more you have advantage to, um, to, to whatever. This is, this is gonna have an impact on, on the layers and the organization of the, of the state itself. Um, I, I hope, Henry, I was able to, to answer to you. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, this paper is a little bit silent is yeah. is mainly like tribe versus state okay. um, rather than more on the complexity of the state and yeah, 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 yeah so 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 my point was like you know so when you have sufficient resources like you extract it could uh, the state could go vertical or co go horizontal so that, that's a question actually i i have but that that's good enough um, so another thing that i maybe i misunderstand something but uh, we talk about uh, a probability of a cereal. Yes. That's that's a key part. Yes. Uh, that facilitated extraction. Uh, yes. Right? So, 
But how, how about the role of money uh, in, in your theory? So money is, is can be easily uh, extracted, right? So it's uh, more portable than surreal. Uh, so would, 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 if your theory is correct, is it true that money, the rise of money could facilitate more sophisticated uh, state? Uh, can we make such a conjecture? Or? So I'm sure we can make such a, such a conjecture and I'm sure it's gonna be uh, right. Um, this paper was more about the emergence of the state. So what I'm trying to say here is without uh, some specialized bureaucrats, which is the difference between you know, the state and the tribe, uh, it would be very difficult to have somehow money. And the second problem with money is transparency. So it's very easy to come to you at the end of harvest and take your cereals. You know, your cereals will be in some storage which is gonna be something big. Everyone knows where it is, and I just take them from you. It's much easier to hide money. Um, so for instance, there is this paper of uh, Raul Sanchez de la Sierra. It's a fantastic paper, by the way. that is about state formation in Congo. And in Congo today, practically in Eastern Congo, you have somehow, you still have some armed groups. You have 90 armed groups, and these are bandits, okay? And sometimes these bandits, they turn stationary next to villages, they start offering protection and they start extracting taxes permanently. Now, there are two things that are produced in Congo. There is uh, coltan and gold. And you know, everything works with money there already. But still, you see that these, these uh, bandits, they turn stationary next to coltan mine once the price of coltan goes up, but they don't turn stationary next to gold mine when the price of gold goes up? And the answer is that, well, it's, it's much more difficult to tax the production of gold because it's very easy to, to hide it. You know, you, you get it from uh, easily from rivers than, than the production of, of coltan that you, you observe you know, very, well, very, very well how much it comes out of the mine. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is uh, Transparency is going to be fundamental. Uh, you know, I, I can produce a lot, but if I can hide what I can produce and I can hide money very easily, it's, very, it's going to be very difficult to tax for. Um, but exactly on these topics, uh, it's true that my paper is a little bit silent. Um, but this is, this is an absolutely relevant question. Thank yeah. you for so, so another question is about, uh, so, so you, the, key paper, the, 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 the key point of the paper is more about uh, the characteristic of surreal, right? It uh, facilitates uh, tax extraction. On the yes. other hand, um, does it, such a characteristic facilitate trade uh, historically? I don't, I don't have any knowledge about that. Whether if this facilitate trade as well, then maybe people could conjecture that, um, because of these characteristic, people trade more uh, with people from village A, trade with uh, people from village B, which um, make a state uh, uh, necessary. Uh, Bandit doesn't provide such a function, right? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. So that could be, uh, could be alternative for like sort of a yes. mechanism to generate what you just uh, Yes, no, so I think your point is absolutely well taken. Uh, a potential mechanism might be through trade. So where the state sort of, this, are, this would be called functionalist theory, the, the state as a function. It protects uh, the trade routes, for instance. And uh, now I think that there are, so there are two things that point against this explanation. One is uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the paper, I, for instance, I look at whether places that were more geographically isolated, we observe different results with respect to places that were less geographically isolated. Where geographical isolation, we measure it in different ways. So for instance, being on the coast versus being on the river uh, versus uh, being located neck close to other uh, settlements, etc. So this doesn't seem to have any impact on the, on the estimates. The second reason why I think uh, this, this, the trade uh, hypothesis does not apply at least to the first civilization 
is that um, the, the first trade that we have seen in humanity comes rather late and is mainly luxury goods. So the trade in, uh, uh, in crops, it comes much later. Um, so you have already places that are, uh, that are organized with complex hierarchies before any evidence of trading crops. Not before evidence of trade in uh, luxury goods. So for instance, in, uh, in Europe, uh, um, you have a lot of these trades, but you know, these are uh, things that would go to the chief, um, yeah. not food. This is my reading of, of the, the story of the first civilizations. This is a beautiful paper. I like it very much. Thank you for the no, answers. Thank you, thank you, Henry, for your question. I, I think you were very perfect. Okay. Okay, Tom. Please. Yes. So, uh, so I think this paper is super interesting. Um, um, so, and the, it's really because I'm doing empirical work myself too. So it's pretty amazing to see that um, you have combined so um, so many data sets and to to test this very neat idea that the features of crops have um, led to the emergence of state. So I just have um, like, uh, I just have three questions or comments. Um, so the first one is that I, I a large chunk of the analysis are using ge uh, geographic variations. So I'm just wondering that, um, but we do observe that in, in some places of the world, domestication, uh, the do domestication of the crops and the emergence of state uh, appeared much earlier than in other places. So I'm just wondering that when you can say something about the timing of the emergence of the, about the emergence of the state or like which, which factors might have promoted or prevented um, domestication of crops of cereals and the emergence of state. Um, uh, yes. Be, uh, besides the theory you are uh, you are promoting um, and, sh so this is and sh should I just ask my second question or, <laughs> or maybe let me answer this so that I before I, I, I tend to forget <laughs> questions I'm becoming old um, on the on the the timing of domestication why is it that some places domesticated earlier than others um, I, I thought until now that this, until like a couple, few months ago, that this paper had not much to say. But somehow I, you know, once I, when I've seen the, the map that we got from the Global uh, Crop Trust about the wild relatives of crops, I don't know if I can share my screen on this. Um, if I can. Yeah, I, I remember that beautiful map. Um, so, this map somehow and you know frankly i was surprised because this is incredible this is just you know wild relatives it's not and somehow these maps is very it, i mean it works so the darkest areas have been the places where you, domestication happened first and uh, so this seemed to be somehow related um but i'm just thinking that even even within China, and we do see cities emerged in some certain places, but not other places. Um, uh, yes, yes. So domestication and started in China. So let's look at China. So we have in the, in the paper a case study about China. And also here, I'd like you to notice that, so these are the places where agriculture started with cereals. And in the maps before, you see that these are the places in China where you have the largest, um, the largest number of wild relatives of cereals. So somehow it seemed, seemed to work, <laughs> even for China. Um, uh, oh, to, to, to be fair, I was surprised about this. Uh, this went above my expectation when I've seen this, these two maps. Um, Okay, um, so my second question is that you used Columbian e exchange as a natural experiment. 
Yes. So I'm just wondering that when the new world uh, roots and tubers are available to the old world, do you actually see that, um, say, places adopted roots and tubers may actually reduce hierarchy? So in other words, do you think your argument may work both ways? Um, Absolutely, yes. So the answer is, so the answer is yes. It's very strong there in the data. So for instance, uh, let's think about Africa because that's where, that's the only place is where, well, it's not the only place, but is where you get the majority of variation up and down after the Columbian exchange. Um, so Africa, the main crops of Africa uh, after the Columbian exchange, they become cassava and maize. They didn't have them before. Uh, cassava is particularly suitable in this region here. And what we observe after the Colombian exchange is a collapse of that region. Now, I understand that there may be other things that are going on. So, you know, if we just look at a particular place, yeah, I know very well the slave trade, how it had an impact, but it's interesting that the, 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 um, so what you have really is a big shock in this inverted L-shaped region. This one, with the maize, you see a huge increase in the productivity of cereals. And this part here with the cassava, instead, you see a big decrease in the productivity advantage of cereals. And you can see that these two parts of Africa react in terms of hierarchical complexity in two, in two exact opposite way after the Colombian exchange. Um, That's really convincing, I think. So, oh, um, thank you. My, my third comment is, um, so, so, I'm, so I'm just thinking that um, you, you mentioned that Sirius may create demand for national defense um, be, because they are e easier to be taxed, but they may also create demand for, say, large irrigation or transportation projects like dams or canals. So Fantastic. those may be potential mechanisms as well for the origin of, of the state. This is uh, you know, exactly the kind of question I was hoping I would get to, to clarify this point. Thank you. So uh, exactly. So another of these functionalist theories of why the state is there is to provide services like irrigation. And uh, you know, I think there is, uh, uh, there is a lot of that that has been written in uh, anthropology, in archaeology, in political science, and even economics. We have some uh, recent paper by Jenna Penson. Um, so that's true. So what we, what we do in the data is practically we control for the potential for irrigation. Okay? So in the regression, we control for this potential for irrigation. And actually, we have data. Uh, um, so no, let, me, let me be more clear. We construct potential for irrigation by looking at the difference in uh, productivity from the land between rain-fed agriculture and, uh, um, and non-rain-fed agriculture. So, and, and agriculture with irrigation. So you get these measures from the FAO. So we take the difference between these two. And so we have a measure of irrigation potential. The other, so we control for this, and actually, exactly in line with our theory, we show that in places, and by the way, this has been shown already by Janet Benson before, but places that have higher irrigation potential, they are characterized by higher level of hierarchy. So your intuition is exactly there. But our results stay there as well, like, you know, stays there uh, and it does not change. Uh, the other thing that we do for the uh, ethnographic atlas, we have data whether they were uh, on, on the use that uh, these societies were doing of irrigation. So we get exactly the same result there. That is, once you control for irrigation, we find a positive impact of irrigation on the level of hierarchical complexity. But again, our results on cereals stays unchanged. But uh, you, you, I mean, this is a great question, of course. Thank you. Okay, so thank, much. okay thank you, Luigi. Uh, for the time limits, uh, I may have to pick up one to two questions from our audience. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, the first is from uh, Guo Hui Jiang. Uh, he's a PhD student from the University of Zurich. Uh, he asks, what's the rule of the trade uh, uh, in, your, in your setting? I think uh, 
he wants to ask the relative importance between trade of the uh, tubers and the roots and uh, the cereals in uh, determining the level of a political hierarchy. So because uh, you know that the, the tubers and the roots might, might be hard to store, but, but if they can be traded, and then the rulers or traders can obtain the immediate benefits from this trade or commodity. Right. Uh, this, is a, this is a great question, of course. So um, the, the point is the following. What is the main difference between cereals and roots and tubers? Is that roots and tubers are humid. They contain a lot of water. This is different than cereals. So um, I remember in a discussion of this paper, uh, an amazing discussion that we had, uh, brought us you know, 100 calories of cereals and 100 calories of potatoes just to see you know, how smaller 100 calories of cereals look like with respect to 100 calories of potatoes. So this to tell that uh, trading in fruits and tubers is very difficult. Okay? Imagine that you know, without trading infrastructure, it's very difficult to move calories in this way. What do I mean it's very difficult to move calories? It means that it takes more calories to move than how much you are moving. So in, in, a, in a sense, uh, trade with roots and tubers is very limited. But of course, now these create a potential problem for us, which was the one that Henry uh, uh, emphasized before, that is like, it can be that what is explaining your results is not the fact that you can impose taxes, but you can, the fact that you, can, that you can have trade once you have cereals. Uh, we, we think this is not there in the data, but we cannot completely rule out uh, this particular mechanism. Yeah. Okay, uh, we just noticed that Professor Sasha Becker is asking a question. Can we invite him in? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> if Sasha, if my co-authors and great friend is asking it. Yeah. So, okay, wait. Let, uh, It's connected. I, I didn't ask anything, sorry. That must be a misunderstanding. But I'm present yeah. and pleased to see Luigi present, but I don't have any question. Great to see okay. you there, Sash. <laughs> okay, uh, let me uh, pick up the second question, maybe also the last question. Uh, that uh, the, the question is whether or not there's some exogenous shock, the shock that changed the planting of the cereals in the history. Whether there is some, uh, I, I, I think I, I understand. So some change in the productivity of cereals? I, uh, I don't know. Uh, he or she just asks that whether or not that some uh, exogenous shock that changes the planting pattern of the cereals in, in certain actually, region or in certain time. Maybe this is actually, a uh, exogenous source, I guess. Yeah. This is fantastic, yes. Um, actually, we were, we were thinking about using this. Uh, yes, I mean, so the, the, this question is exactly the, the question. That is, can you get something else to, that moves the productivity of, of cereals over roots and tubers, uh, generated maybe by this new technology that has variation over, over geography, over, uh, over space. So the, uh, we were thinking about, at one point, playing a little bit with the rotation of crops. So the rotation of crops create different advantages between cereals and roots and tubers, and has different, uh, um, different, uh, um, uh, different impact depending on the characteristics of the soil. So this could be one. The second one is, of course, the introduction of the plow. And what is interesting is that, well, we, we know very well from, uh, um, uh, from previous work that uh, uh, the, 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 there are data about the, uh, the plow available um, and the suitability of the soil for the plow and the introduction of the plow. So this is another way which actually we could have a shock 
on productivity of cereals, which would be, uh, which would have, which, which vary, you know, over time before and after the introduction of technology and over space, depending on the characteristics of the soil. These are actually great, great ideas. Okay. Okay, great paper, great work. Uh, I think time's up. We, have, we may have stopped here. Thank you so much again, uh, Professor Luigi Pascale. Uh, and also thank, uh, uh, thank our uh, panelists, discussant, and, uh, and all the audience. So uh, in June, June 11, Thursday, uh, we will have the next webinar. Uh, this time we will be very honored to uh, have our uh, webinar organizer, uh, Professor Zhu Chen from Hong Kong University, to give a talk uh, about the maritime Silk Road uh, in the haze trade. And based on that, he will talk about the Silk Road trade and also different civilizations. It's a big topic. And the webinar will be in Chinese. So welcome to uh, register and uh, attend uh, the next uh, webinar. Okay, so today okay. we will stop here. Thank you for your participations. Thank you again, Luigi. Thank you very much uh, to, to the panelists. Like, really, it was a real great pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you, thank Luigi. You. Hope uh, things will get better in uh, Barcelona. Yes, and I look forward to be hopefully one day back in Hong Kong and see you personally. Okay. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Tom. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Mm.